It's a show about a crime fighter whose partner is a talking car. Michael, are you all right? Actually, that's really it. Guy with a talking car. But it's a really cool show about a really cool guy with a really cool talking car. Time to engage super review mode. I'd rather you didn't. Night Rider. <laughs> Maybe the idea of a talking car that drives itself isn't so fanciful now, but how about one that snootily talks back to the driver? It always makes you feel so much better on those rare occasions when you outthink me. Well, that's funny. That's, that's very funny. In the early 1980s, producer Glenn A. Larson wanted an early release from his deal at Universal Studios. Part of the agreement was that he had to create one last show, and it was suggested that he could write it about a supercar of some description. Larson remembered a souped-up car from an episode of one of his earlier series, BJ and the Bear, and very quickly the idea came together as the pilot for a show that NBC was interested in, Knight Rider. Casting was an issue since NBC wasn't sure they wanted David Hasselhoff, oh. who at the time was known for Daytime Soap, The Young and the Restless, and occasional low-budget films such as Star Crash. One of the other frontrunners was a pre-Miami Vice Don Johnson, but Hasselhoff was Larson's pick for a pilot presentation, a cut-down version of the eventual first episode to show to networks. According to Larson, NBC bought the show, but the network wasn't so sure about The Talking Car or David Hasselhoff. Did they just want the Devon Miles mysteries? <laughs> Talking cars sound cool and all, but long before Knight Rider, there had been the notorious sitcom failure My Mother the Car, about a man who bought an old banger only to find his dead mother's voice coming through the radio. That show had fouled the water for decades for any talking car based series, making the concept of a talking car poison to TV networks and producers. Apart from the Little C 1970s series, Pinto the Talking Exploding Shitbox. Michael Long was a police officer on a stakeout when his partner is killed. Mutz, you gotta hang on. When he's almost mortally wounded by a gunshot to the head, where the bullet apparently missed all of his vital organs by nearly two feet. Michael's body has been recovered by the dying billionaire and apparent grave robber, Wilton Knight. Michael Long is nursed back to health and given a new face. That bad? On the contrary. He's also given a new name. Michael Knight? Michael Long is dead, remember that. Wilton has an organization called the Foundation for Law and Government. Before passing away, Wilton Knight gives Michael Knight a new purpose, to fight for justice where people can't get it through traditional channels. It does sound suspiciously like an extrajudicial vigilante crime fighter job. What are you, an undercover cop? Something like that. As part of the foundation, Michael Knight has no ties to the courts, police, secret service, military or government, carries no badge, yet can arrest people without reading them their rights. Got all the evidence you need, Lieutenant, right there. And, well, you know, he does sound like he's Batman. Don't you tell us. <laughs> The Foundation for Law and Government also has no legal affiliations or official standing, but as the show wore on, seemed to be part charity foundation, part private investigation firm, and part high-tech research institute. The foundation is headed by Devon Miles, who becomes Michael's new boss. And then, of course, there's Michael's new partner, Kit. The Knight Industries 2000 was a car that looked suspiciously like a 1982 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am but one that had a built-in turbo boost function that could launch the car into the air. Kit was incredibly fast and was filled with a variety of scanners and computers, communications devices and lots of gadgets. But also, Kit could speak. All these weird gadgets, you think they'd give you a radio. What would you like to hear? What the hell was that? I am the voice of Knight Industry 2000's microprocessor. K-I-T-T -T for easy reference. Kit's outer skin resisted most damage and was impervious to almost any attack. I say almost any attack because Kit would occasionally come off second best, be completely destroyed, yet somehow rebuilt good as new by the next commercial break. Among his growing list of abilities, Kit had lasers or could resist lasers, 
could jam other mechanical and electronic devices. What's going on? They seem to be out of control. Had self-driving facilities without worrying about trolley problems, contained ejector seats that he used both for good and for evil, he could play games and he even had built-in video chat. But unfortunately, he couldn't display animated GIFs. Kit also had the most reliable in-vehicle satellite navigation ever. It's exactly 3.5 miles. 3.5 miles, good. Michael and Kit quickly became partners and best friends. Don't fall in love with one of these beautiful cars and uh, run off on me, huh? I wouldn't dream of it. Solving crimes wherever Michael needed to go. I mean, he had no actual legal jurisdiction per se, but it would be nice if his missions would take place somewhere where there were roads and also within a short distance from Los Angeles. What exactly is the allure of Southern California? Michael tried to educate Kit on humanity. You just weren't bite, well, that's how fishing is. Sometimes it bites, sometimes it don't. While Kit would look down his nose or hood at various things, people, other cars, other modes of transport, or whatever. Kit's actually pretty, pretty snobby. Sounds like a little professional jealousy to me. Jealous? Of those high-powered broomsticks on wheels? Like Auntie Beryl when she's signing for her weekly packages of bulk depilatory cream. Would you rather go to New Mexico? Or Chicago. Chicago in March. I am on my way to New Mexico. Knight Rider was a product of the Universal Studios factory that cranked out several action adventure series at the same time. While his company produced the show, Glenn A. Larson, after the pilot, was too busy working on Auto Man or Manimal to involve himself too deeply in Knight Rider business. A succession of producers handled the making of Knight Rider, some of whom got the show more than others. You're real good, but you don't fool me. While in the pilot, Kit was created to look like Michael Long's car, that's quietly forgotten as Kit would later meet a prototype, Car, who looks exactly like Kit, but is somehow evil. I will protect you. Brace for collision. <laughs> In the Knight Rider universe, and there is a Knight Rider universe, generally the only 1982 Trans Ams you will see are those created by Knight Industries. In Knight Rider, people generally, but not always, refer to Kit as a T-top. Some guy in a black T-top. Did you look at this T-top here? Some joker in a black T-top. You're my T-top. I'm having a little problem with a joker in a hot Trans Am. He's been on my tail for two days. Every time I think I've lost him, he shows up again. Michael Knight did not exist before 1982. His personality, likes and dislikes, and of course his voice, are the same as Michael Long, which could be tricky whenever Michael ran into somebody from his former life. Perhaps because Michael Long owed people money, or maybe he promised to help them move apartments next time. Michael had simple tastes. Fast food. Even Michael Knight wouldn't eat that stuff. Rock and roll, women and cars. He also speaks like somebody auditioning for an early 70s exploitation film. I'm gonna push you, man. I'm gonna push you to the breaking point. Now you can count on that! Michael is not an invincible hero. He does occasionally lose a fight, but more often than not, he emerges the victor. He's also fond of tackling problems head on. I wouldn't push it if I were you. You're not me. Rather than quietly seeking answers... Well, go ahead. What are you afraid of? You got something to hide. He will more likely go up to the assumed villain and threaten to take them down there and then. One more word out of you, and you're gonna wish you were never born. One more word out of you, you're gonna wish I ever was either. He's a great person to have around when you need to take your car back to a stroppy dealer for a warranty repair, but he would also make a lousy vocational guidance counsellor. A lot of men would die for duty like this. You nearly have on several occasions. David Hasselhoff's personal charm and charisma often carries the show whenever the scripts are less than adequate. <laughs> no kidding. Even for a hero in an action series, he's very tall, looking like a giraffe with a perm. If Hasselhoff ever caught fire, he could mount a one-man production of The Towering Inferno. His height meant guest stars often had to be taller. Could you lean down a little? Otherwise, it would look like Michael Knight was making out with a teenager. She was just... 10 years older and two feet taller. Michael Knight had many girlfriends, but only one true love, whom he would occasionally bump into. His ex-fiancee, Stevie, played by the then Mrs. Hasselhoff, Catherine Hicklin. Stevie was someone hiding from crooks and got a new identity, which happened to be as a famous rock singer. So I guess that's hiding in plain sight. Found her. Like when you spend five hours looking for your reading glasses only to find them on the top of your head. Michael and Stevie would eventually marry on the show, but we'll come back to that later. Uh-oh. Irish-born actor Edward Mulhair is Devon Miles. 
Mulhe had been in many theatrical, movie and TV productions, including a stint as the title character in the late 60s sitcom The Ghost and Mrs Muir. To clarify, he was the ghost. I do know how to drive. I would have preferred you to have let me open the door first. Devon Miles' role in the show would vary as episodes required, though most often he'd appear at the start to brief Michael on a mission or show up briefly at the end to wrap up the storyline. I have no intention of discussing this case ever again. Other episodes featured Devon in a larger role, and the series would use the supporting characters more and more as the show ran. Is that all you can find to say, madam? Devon would see himself put in jail, become the target of various plots. You okay? Right, it's rain, my dear fellow. And once was even kidnapped and replaced by a near-perfect double. Michael, wherever you are, please hurry. Devon and Michael are initially a little standoffish, but grow into firm friends. Another one of your wild toga parties, huh? That is not very funny, Michael. Despite Michael's simple tastes and Devon's innate pomposity. I intensely dislike being talked about in the third person. Devon is a guy who would help you move house. Well, he'd pay a guy to help you move house. But he would also insist on putting your couch perpendicular to your television and not parallel. Then that's it, Kit. You should be functioning flawlessly. At least until that nut starts abusing you. Thanks a lot. Dr. Bonnie Barstow took care of maintaining Kit. She was part mechanic, part engineer, part computer programmer. Bonnie felt very protective of Kit and is proud of the technical work she's done for the Foundation. Bonnie's usually to be found at the Foundation or on the roving Foundation semi-trailer, with its mobile garage featuring a maintenance bay, rest facilities, subway, Starbucks and all the comforts. I mean, Michael never seems to need an empty bottle for those long road trips, does he? Michael clearly had a lot of affection for Bonnie. You might need them if you get caught between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, I know what that's like. What? So long as one of his other lady friends wasn't present. He did get a little stroppy that one time she showed an interest in another man. Okay, so he was an assassin, but you could have been a bit cool about it, Michael. In the second season, Bonnie disappears, replaced by April Curtis in more or less the exact same role. Rebecca Holden was a little more glamorous and seemed to be fitting in the role reasonably well, though realistically she's no Bonnie. Why would we go to all this trouble if we didn't care about you? Patricia McPherson was brought back by popular demand for the remainder of the show's run. Finally, in the last season, we had Reginald Cornelius III, also known as RC3. RC was a street-level vigilante in his hometown of Chicago who gave up cleaning the streets to, well, I think he's supposed to drive the semi. RC, I would prefer a more personalised driving experience. It really is a trifle unsettling to find RC chatting away in here while 30 tonnes of truck rolls down the highway driverless. RC is young and enthusiastic and occasionally provides support on missions requiring someone on the spot. What have you been doing down there? Try to climb out! Though the Foundation doesn't even provide him with a Comlink watch and makes him use his own motorbike. I assume he's kept a log of the mileage for his tax return. You go against Josh, you go against Michael Knight and you can add me to that list. Kit was voiced by actor William Daniels who was not credited on screen. Daniels was a familiar face on television and starred in the medical drama Saint Elsewhere, which was in production all through Knight Rider's run. On set, Kit's lines would be fed to the actors by the script supervisor and Daniels would later head to a recording studio, perform his lines for one or two episodes and head home. Now remember Michael, my synthesizers can operate on any kind of combustible fluids. Daniels and Hasselhoff didn't meet in person until the show's first Christmas party, months after the show had already become a hit. Oh yeah, the car talks. Daniels' kit is fussy. I've tried to interest Michael in the romance languages, but he prefers things like rock and roll and girls in bikinis. At times quite prissy. Forty dollars and not a penny more. And also a little pissy. Really? He's a fussy, prissy, pissy computer. With your usual lack of subtlety, you would have no problem at all in panicking anyone with anything at all to hide. Actually, Just they... Scared. Yes, Michael, I know. Shut up. Knight Rider stories do have a formula. Michael is assigned to a mission or stumbles into a situation. He quickly fixates on who the main villain is, threatens them, and then after a bunch of stunts revolving around Kit's special abilities, Michael and Kit save the day. Betrayal seems to be a big part of most Knight Rider stories. There was often some ally of this week's guest star who turns out to be in league with the villain of the week. Why Tommy Lee? How could you do it, Vince? I thought you were my friend. Or indeed is the villain of the week themselves. 
a trusted advisor, an old friend, a hitherto unmentioned person associated with the foundation that turns out to be, the technical term is shitty old. You're not much, but you're the only birthday present I got. Most of the time, Michael and Kit had the technological advantage, but occasionally, Kit would face off against a mechanical foe that even he had to work hard to defeat. There was his predecessor, Carr. Just pointing out what should be obvious. And of course, the Juggernaut. Michael! But then there was also the deadly semi driven by Wilton Knight's hitherto unmentioned son, Garth, with an E. Did you say Goliath? Yeah! I thought I'd mention that. You certainly did not. If there's a single least exciting part of Knight Rider, it's usually the comic relief scenes of Kit having been left alone by Michael, instantly becoming the target of a would-be thief, dogs looking to relieve themselves, people wanting to vandalise Kit, etc. A few of these produce the odd chuckle, but many are cringeworthy, like coming last in a sack race only to find out that it wasn't actually a sack race but the Olympic 100 meter men's final. Will you kindly take this poor man's King Kong off my person? Knight Rider occasionally dipped into Michael Long's past. We met his old partner, old enemies, and several episodes used the Foundation's history for story ideas. Wilton Knight's family would show up and at least for part of their episodes be a thorn in the side of Michael and Devon. Wilton Knight's daughter held sway over the Foundation's board. His widow turned out to be a scheming mother. And there was Wilton's son, Garth with an E. And you will be defeated. You, the Foundation for Law and Government, and Michael Knight. Despite his facial reconstruction being modelled on a younger Wilton Knight, Michael also looks like Garth with an E. Oh, really? Hasselhoff would play a dual role of Michael as normal and Garth, with an E, as a larger-than-life character. Michael Knight will die. Over-enunciating, snorting and chewing the scenery like a goat that's been mistakenly hired to protect the scenery from other goats. Our last encounter wasn't a defeat, it was merely a temporary setback. Garth, with an E, had apparently been in jail in Africa. I promised to take you to Africa. But was sprung, swearing revenge on whoever there was. Michael. Devon, Kit, that slightly bitter orange juice he had this morning, the man who cleaned the pool, the milkman. Send him in. It's ready. In the end, you will lose. In the end, you're gonna be mine. Now it's time to cash in, huh? Say hi to your mom. Knight Rider was a show about a car, so stories rarely went places that Kit could not go. Many episodes revolved around some form of racing, stunt driving, rally driving, off-roading, dirt bikes, car shows, demolition derbies, monster trucks, killer drone cars, armoured cars, bulletproof limos, a few episodes around big rigs, even a show with a hovercraft. Kit even managed to stay afloat on water that one time and turbo boosted out of any number of predicaments. Buried alive? Turbo boost. Need to get through lava? Turbo boost. <laughs> One thing Knight Rider never showed, the immense amount of paperwork that Devon had to take care of, such as the insurance claim forms to cover the enormous cost of repairing Kit time and time again. After all, bonnies don't grow on trees. By the early 80s, car chases and automotive stunts had become a staple of the action-adventure genre, but Knight Rider became a show where the elaborate stunts were a major part of the show's attraction. I mean, watching Kit just drive down the road while sound -alike eagles play on the soundtrack is alright, I guess, but what you really want to see was Kit jumping over things, or sometimes into them. Here we go, pal. I hope it's the right apartment, Michael. There were many versions of Kit used in the show. One with a full interior, several cars for long shots, fast driving scenes and particular stunts. Throughout four seasons, stunt coordinator and later second unit director Jack Gill and his team created many great stunt sequences for the show, though it's not clear how many cars were wrecked during production. There is a fine line between audacious and foolhardy. In order to show Kit driving without a driver at the wheel, some versions of Kit were created with a special seat that concealed the stunt driver, making it look as if Kit was an early self-driving car, but without the crashes and vexing moral issues. 
At other times when Michael was driving during long dialogue scenes, a common practice was, and still is, to have the car towed so that the actors can concentrate on their performance and let the tow truck driver worry about mowing down pedestrians. This looked much better than relying on back projection. Have I told you you're the greatest lately? If you film the stunt from various angles, it is very rude not to use every single angle. The Night Industry 2000 will be a memento of my ultimate triumph. When the show began, the 1982 Pontiac Firebird was so new that it was almost impossible to get hold of. Despite the publicity from being featured in a hit show, Pontiac wasn't about to furnish the makers of Knight Rider with all the cars that they would need for the show for free. But then in late 1982, a train carrying Firebirds and other cars derailed. They were damaged just enough that they were still usable, but couldn't be sold, since apparently US car companies have standards. A few usable cars were snapped up and modified for use in the series. At the time, there was no reason to suspect foul play in the derailment, but authorities did want to speak to this person of interest. If you're going to arrest me, I'd like to know the charge. If not, I'm out of here. Over the years, the show used more stock shots of Kit winding down roads and occasionally reused stunt footage. Not every Kit stunt was the result of a stunt driver, with miniatures used way more often than you'd think on this show. Uh, you won't be here. I beg your pardon? Many conflicting stories exist regarding Patricia McPherson's departure for the second season and her replacement by Rebecca Holden. In lieu of confirmable facts, we'll do what conspiracy theorists do and go for the least likely and most implausible explanation. McPherson may have been transported to the alien planet Zarbon as a cultural exchange student. Pressure was put on producers by fans and Hasselhoff and Mulher for McPherson to return and the actress was back for the third and fourth seasons. I was wondering if I could get a uh, student loan. I think you're in the wrong department. Yeah, well, uh, I bet Devin you'd return after a year and you did. Oh <laughs> the Zarbon theory is clearly bullshit. Or is it? But no, really, it's bullshit. Or is it? Wink, wink. Shut up. It's all mine, Michael. At the start of the fourth season, Kit is, again, more or less destroyed, again, and quickly repaired as good as new, again, now with some modifications. May I suggest you try my new Super Pursuit mode? <laughs> Super Pursuit mode would involve Kit transforming from a sleek two-door coupe into whatever the hell this is. Spoilers and wings and jets would appear, and Kit could travel even faster, apparently sacrificing some agility whenever Michael engaged Super Pursuit mode. Super Pursuit mode. There was also the emergency braking system, which would see panels pop out of the car to slow down Kit's momentum in a hurry. Ashley 3, what's this button? What button? This one, Mark C. Then there was also the C button, which was not a pointed reference to David Hasselhoff, but instead turned Kit from a T-top into a full convertible. In the first three seasons, when Michael or Kit would engage Turbo Boost, there would be about as much discussion as a vacuum cleaner deciding whether to suck up a coin. Give me Super Pursuit Mode. Super Pursuit Mode. Super Pursuit Mode. Super Pursuit Mode. Super Pursuit. Go to Super Pursuit Mode. It's possible that 30% of Hasselhoff's dialogue in this fourth season consisted of Michael and Kit debating whether or not to activate Super Pursuit Mode. All right, let's go. Super Pursuit Mode. Super Pursuit Mode. Super Pursuit Mode, pal. Just press the goddamn button, Michael. I mean, if you went skydiving and spent too long debating as to whether you should pull the ripcord, you could find yourself wishing you weren't such a terrible procrastinator. The fourth season would see the producers amp up the storylines. They became more fantastical and hyperbolic. Super pursuit mode. Occasionally bordering on overwrought. It wasn't a massive drop in quality. So fixing a point at which Knight Rider turbo boosted the shark is difficult. But it doesn't necessarily follow, Michael. The season's intended final episode featured Michael, having been injured, deciding to leave the Foundation and finally marry Stevie. We are treated to a romantic montage of Michael and Stevie frolicking on the beach with Kit in tow before the couple finally marry. Except some bad guys show up to try and kill Michael but instead gun down his bride. It would have been a fantastic final episode. Except it was eventually run in the middle of the season 
while a run of lesser episodes closed out the show. That's good, Michael. What is that, uh, Shakespeare? <laughs> Michael Knight. Knight Rider ended after four seasons for no readily apparent reason. People's tastes change. They like new design. Its ratings had always been solid. A hit with kids, definitely. But only its second season appeared in the top 30 scripted programs of the year. OK, Bob. Knight Rider, with its physical stunts, gags, and insatiable requirement for industrial strength hair volumizer, was not a cheap show to make. After four seasons and the equivalent of 91 hour episodes, Knight Rider was shy 10 shows for a standard syndication package. The crew believed they would go to a fifth season, and the producers tried to tempt the studio into continuing by making the latter episodes of season four much more economically than before. It was to little avail. When it finally looked as though Knight Rider would not be able to command the sort of money the studio had expected from syndicating Knight Rider. Non-profit? You're right. I doubt Sonny's ever heard of you. Universal cut its losses and cancelled the show themselves. I thought it was dead! Knight Rider, a shadowy flight into the dangerous world of a man who does not exist. Knight Rider proved resilient enough for several attempts at relaunching the property. None of these attempts to relaunch the franchise captured the magic of the original series. I look at you and I see something I don't see in other people. I see a softness. I see a tenderness. You're a good actress, girl. You're real good, but you don't fool me. Out of all of Universal series from the 1980s, Knight Rider must surely rank as one of their properties with the most longevity. Many people who loved Knight Rider back in the day still love it. Not me, buddy. Perhaps you care to explain the logic behind your decision? Back in the day, I was in the target age group, but I dropped off watching the series somewhere in the second season. I have memories of watching the first season and at least the second season premiere with Goliath, but that's about it. It's only in watching it again in full for this review that I've come to appreciate the show's dynamic goofus energy and the Hoff. Come on, girl. Give me that gun. Come on. Knight Rider, while not a super violent show, is a series that has a relatively high body count. She's dead. I detect only the remains of human life. I'm afraid he's gone, Michael. Oh, no, human remains. People are murdered all over the place. It can be hard to stay alive in the world of Knight Rider. <laughs> But at least it's not as bad as the jaunty grim reaper known as Jessica Fletcher in Murder, She Wrote. All right, I need everything you can give me. One of the latter second season episodes saw Michael Knight barely appear. Why? Because the episode was what was known as a backdoor pilot. Kit has no back doors. Mouth of the Snake mainly revolved around the character David Dalton, working as a martial arts expert fighting crime for the government. This idea was later retooled for another pilot with a character now styled after John Rambo as an ex-vet drifter. Code of Vengeance rated well enough and the series was ordered, but cancelled after four episodes. Do you know it's only been four? Knight Rider's theme tune completes the illusion. Written by series creator Glenn A. Larson and longtime musical collaborator Stu Phillips, Knight Rider's simple bassline and synth parts were used to accentuate the action. I'm with a private organization called the Foundation for Law and Government. We're investigating Kevin's death. The main melody is taken from a piece of classical music by Leo Delib. Larson's 80s shows tended to use a lot of cover versions of popular songs, and Knight Rider was no exception. Don Peake composed the background music for the bulk of the show. It's very 80s, but it also holds up very well if you happen to like 80s synth sounds. Wilton Knight, seen in the pilot and heard in the opening titles throughout the series, was played by former Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea star Richard Basehart. Michael Knight, a lone crusader in a dangerous world, the world of the Knight Rider. Knight Rider has a lot of familiar faces in the show. Lots of character actors or serious actors and actresses, starlets and even child actors who were in everything going. Maybe he doesn't use unleaded gas. There's What's-His-Face. It's that actress from the show, you know, the one. 
Many familiar faces who played villains in every show appear somewhere in Knight Rider. Where's Lance? Oh, there he is. And like any show, there are a few people who went on to much bigger roles after the series. Are you suspicious of me? The better Knight Rider episodes for me were usually the ones that showed that Michael and Kit were in the same universe each week. Shows that would build on what had been established previously. Internal continuity is generally pretty decent. Overall, I think I enjoyed the ones where the concept was a little more outrageous and stories that used Devon, Bonnie, April and RC more than the ones where it was just Michael and Kit in the country facing off against, oh, I don't know, crooked sheriffs and murderous businessmen, which could have been from any series of the time. Like I was saying, Kit, there was Billy the Kid with two Ds. Yeah, that's the one. Here are some of the episodes I enjoyed most. Kit gets amnesia and is found by Jason Bateman. Scanner, X-ray, infrared, turbo boost. Don't touch turbo boost. Something tells me you shouldn't touch Turbo Boost. Michael gets amnesia and he thinks he's Michael Long again. What are you trying to tell me? I'm dead? You were Michael Long. You now have a new identity, a new purpose. You are now Michael Knight. I don't normally like amnesia storylines, but I don't remember why. One episode saw Kit turning against Michael. Michael Knight sighted, attack mode engaged. Kit, no. Another saw Michael leave the Foundation in disgrace. I mean, you know how that's going to end, but still. We are still in the process of interviewing possible replacements. Why shop for ground round when you've got top sirloin right on your plate? That's what you always say, is it? Kit's computer functions are separated from the car and he's stuck in a temporary housing sitting in the front seat of Devon's Mercedes. How you doing down there, okay? How are you doing down there? You're making me feel like a child. The episodes where Stevie came into Michael's life gave Hasselhoff his best opportunities for acting. I don't know if I can right now. The Goliath episodes where Garth with an E were a lot of fun, with Hasselhoff chewing the scenery as Garth with an E. After all, we have so much in common. Our surname, our faces, my father. Why not our future? And the two episodes where Kit faced off against Carl were a lot of fun. You may not be a Latin, but I am the genie. I can make all your dreams come true. Why don't you get in? Just for old time's sake. You said some guy in a black Trans Am had been following you. In this video, we use the terms Trans Am and Firebird to describe the car Kit was based on. The actual car is a Pontiac Firebird, and Trans Am was an options package that upgraded various performance components and some of the bodywork. So all Trans Ams are Firebirds, but not all Firebirds are Trans Ams. Oh, we're not going to have any trouble catching that domestic piece of aluminum. Unless you're looking to buy one, it's really only an important distinction to car fanatics and whoever is the most annoying person in the pub. That is, of course, assuming they're not one and the same. Trans Am or Firebird, a stock car couldn't perform turbo boost jumps. Unless, of course, you rented one from Hertz and found a long straight road with a speed bump. You're one in a million, pal. I know. Obviously, where I live, Pontiacs are not a common sight. But in 1982, my father did buy a new dark blue Mitsubishi Starion. Apart from it being a sleekish two-door car, they really looked very little alike. But whenever my dad picked me up from school, kids would shout out, Knight Rider. How about Super Pursuit Mode? At least it won't prolong the agony. Oh, can do. I need all the maneuverability I can get. I'm generally not a fan of American cars of the 80s, but that 1982 Trans Am still looks very cool. How much of that is down to the luster of Knight Rider? It's possibly 50-50 according to the Hofometer. Kid, you are in a class all by yourself. After the show became popular, Hasselhoff's music career took off in Europe. He released several albums in Europe that became popular in Europe. Of course, David Hasselhoff's biggest success came after his series Baywatch was cancelled by NBC after one season. The Hoff swooped in and, as executive producer, relaunched the show as a syndicated show that became a massive worldwide success. It's like missing your flight by 10 seconds, which forces you to take a train instead. But then later on, you see the missed flight had a horrendous diarrhea outbreak on board. Baywatch is perhaps Hasselhoff's biggest success, though I don't know how many people were actually watching it for him. How's that car doing that? Toto, Toto, Toto. Who said that? Some viewers will remember William Daniels from his later sitcom Boy Meets World and its spin-offs. What was that story you told me about Zardu Hasselfrau? Who? He owned a magic boat. David Hasselhoff? Right. Not a magic boat, a talking car. 
Why did he talk again? Post Baywatch, Hasselhoff seems to have traded more on his meme clout, more or less appearing as himself in the oddest of places. <laughs> Knight Rider was an action-adventure series about a man with a talking car, but it was more than that. Okay, it wasn't that much more than that, but it's a show where the elements brought together by its makers worked so well, you could usually forgive minor flaws. That's so bad. The car is cool, Hasselhoff is charming, Devon, Bonnie, Arcee and April are all likeable enough. People are enjoying these adventures decades later. So, do you want to turbo boost or engage super pursuit mode? Do I say thanks? If you do, I'll say you're welcome. Thanks, Donata. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. Not now, Barry. Here comes the good part. Now that's gnarly. Now's the time for Super Pursuit.